All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Jurafsky. I'm a professor of linguistics and computer science here at Stanford and part of the HAI faculty. And I'm the moderator for today's talk by Dan McFarland. Uh, before we get started, some quick admin stuff. The chat on the Zoom is disabled, but we'd love to hear your questions. So you can go to Slido um, and you can see a QR code in the slides that are, that's about to be on your screen um, or there's a link in the chat. And I'll be monitoring these questions during the, perform, the, uh, the presentation, Dan's talk. And then at the end, we'll have a chance to ask him those questions. So I'm thrilled to introduce Dan McFarland. Dan received his PhD in sociology at the University of Chicago and has been at Stanford for two decades, since 2000, where he's professor at Stanford University School of Education and professor by courtesy of sociology and of organizational behavior. Dan is a winner of numerous academic research awards and teaching awards for his research and teaching focusing on creating novel sociological understandings of science. He's a pioneer in the use of big data and social networks and new computational and statistical models in the study of education and academia. I should also mention that Dan's been a huge influence on my own research. Dan was one of the pioneers that first showed us how to integrate social science research questions with new computational tools. So Dan, we're very excited to hear your findings. Take it away. Hey, thank you, Dan. That was really kind of you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, let me share screen and I will get rolling here. Okay, uh, does everybody see this all right? Okay, great. Um, so this is work that was published in the, the uh, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, last year. And we haven't had too many chances to present it due to COVID and the like. But this is work uh, that was led by Bas Hofstra, who's now at Nijmegen U University, uh, and, a, and a whole team of, of wonderful people who you see listed here who contributed in, in various ways. Um, the general argument of this paper, uh, it raises the conundrum and the, the first conundrum uh, or the first thing that we all kind of uh, see in research repeatedly is how diversity breeds innovation, right? And this comes both in terms of, of uh, structurally uh, distinct groups of people coming together uh, that are far apart as well as heterogeneity. And, and like one of the buzzwords you hear now is neurodiversity, right? But the general idea is, is diversity uh, generates innovation. Uh, the second part is uh, that we also have a, a lot of work uh, out there arguing that there, there's innovation that generates successful careers. And this is often with prizes like Nobel laureates. Uh, we call them trailblazers, discoverers, pioneers, and the like. And, and this supposedly, uh, you know, what we'd like to see in science then is something like this pipeline of diversity, breeding innovation, which breeds these successful careers. In a lot of organizations, this is known as kind of a paradox because that doesn't usually uh, always uh, come about. Um, and particularly the question becomes, uh, well, what's going on in science for us? And so if you look at, at science and, and the National Center of Educational Statistics, uh, we still have uh, quite a bit of inequality in terms of representation. So one of, one of the things is to look at the general population and which groups are being represented as full professors. Uh, in on academic councils and the like. And, and it's, it's underrepresented for various groups and it persists to be so, especially as we get into the higher ranks. This is not new to a lot of us. It's a persistent problem that we're trying to confront and, and kind of against the principles of universalism and impersonalism in science, right? So the idea is to rectify this. Um, in particular, so for science, underrepresented groups are, are, are not having the career path uh, that you would, you would like to see. And in particularly, if we consider how underrepresented groups bring diversity, they likely bring innovation, which likely should result in some career. So we wanted to see whether this holds here and have some explanation for, for why this is uh, potentially happening. So to answer this kind of question, uh, you need kind of uh, several things. You need to study some representation of diversity, some representation of innovation, and some representation of careers. And you'd like it to be the kinds of, of data or information that's useful for that. So what you'd like for diversity is to have a, a, a population of scholars that isn't biased, that represents most fields and, and many groups. 
Uh, you'd like to know success and failure cases, not just the people who are faculty, but the people who uh, had the potential to become faculty. Um, and you'd like to link that to knowledge production, right? To the knowledge itself. And here with innovation and metrics of it, you have questions about how to measure that. Uh, how do we represent that? And how do we capture that for, for all disciplines equally? And then finally, how do you link that to careers? So in particularly <clears throat> for us, careers are whether uh, these individuals go on to faculty jobs or continue being researchers publishing. And it turns out that we found this uh, nice database. Uh, we can't find all those uh, characteristics in other databases, but we did find it in the ProQuest doctoral thesis database, which has a near census of, of US PhD recipients. And this is for the United States. So I realize that's not what everybody might be interested in, but we're limiting to that. Uh, the coverage hits about 1.2 million uh, theses. It's, it's best represented in the years 1980 to 2010 or 2015. We cut off at the end so people have a chance to get a career. Um, and this covers about uh, 84 disciplines. Uh, if, if you look at the National Research uh, Council in terms of their disciplines, that's all of them. Uh, and about 215 research universities. So it's, it's a, a great coverage and it has text. So it has actual ideas in there. Um, and it has people who go on to be researchers and people who don't. So a potential pool of, of these uh, individuals. Now here's the, the comparison of what ProQuest has compared to uh, the National Center of Educational Statistics, their census that they do uh, with institutions. And it's comparable. Um, and we actually use this uh, comparison as a weight for a lot of our data so that we can make some kind of uh, argument about the population in the United States. So I wanna walk you through this argument step-by-step. Step. And the, the first step here is, is what, do we, what do we represent as diversity? Um, and here we're, I'm gonna talk about how we try to uh, identify numerical minorities. Uh, so whether gender or racial minority, and this, this can vary over time and by field. So for example, I'm in education and arguably uh, men are a gender minority in that field, whereas in computer science, uh, men are the, the majority by, by far. Uh, there's also notions of historical minority. So even if this changes, uh, there may be some vestige of the past. And so we also look at that of, of women and non-white. Um, we, we do look at kind of these binary things and realize that, that you know, identities are more continuous and, and there's non-dominant genders now uh, uh, out there and other things that we could classify. But I think the argument in this case uh, was that in order to kind of uh, reveal inequities or to uh, address certain or interrogate institutions and help them see their problems, sometimes this kind of approach is needed and, and affords some insight of value. Uh, we also realized uh, there's other groups and other ways of representing, and we try to talk about that and what that would be in the paper. Uh, the second, so, okay, let me go into diversity measure, how we do it. Uh, in particular, we, we, we do this because there isn't a uh, there isn't a database that identifies all these individuals' uh, attributes. And so what we end up doing is we try to predict with full names. So we take uh, the names of these individuals, of US individuals, and we try to classify using a variety of tools, uh, their gender and race. Um, and uh, we do reasonably well uh, for the classes that we use in the paper in the sense of, of about 90, percent accuracy and 85% recall compared to these databases uh, in terms of uh, Florida voter rolls, gender rise, private universities and the like. Um, so that's, that's how we identify these different groups. Um, in terms of identifying who is a numerical minority or, or the like, this gives you some idea. Here, here are two plots uh, for a variety of fields that show you the, on the left, the fraction of male scholars is the y-axis and the x-axis is time. And it shows you the proportion of men in each field. And, and you see things like engineering is mostly male. Social sciences, which includes education would be almost 40% uh, male by 2010. Now in terms of what constitutes a numerical gender majority, this can flip obviously. So. You know, in social sciences, you see here, it kind of dips and then goes back up in the sense that women are now the majority. So as you have these fields change, this 
what what constitutes or where the cutoff of you being in a majority or minority uh, can change. So we, we try to represent this uh, in different ways. Uh, in terms of white and non-white, uh, which is more, uh, you know, one of the, the traditional or historic inequities in a lot of science, uh, we do this again with the fraction uh, on the left, you see the fraction of white scholars and humanities in this case is, is primarily white. Uh, engineering is, is not. So while engineering may be uh, homogenous in terms of gender, it's, it's quite heterogeneous, uh, perhaps in some regards with, with regard to uh, not being exclusively white. Um, and then if you look at what constitutes a majority, engineering actually flips back and forth. And this actually happens to be primarily Asian, I think, in this case, uh, in, in that regard. So here we have different notions of, uh, of, of gender and race as non-white white, and then we have majority minority representations that can fluctuate over time for different groups. And we want to see whether that has some kind of influence on whether you have novel contributions or uh, even contributions that are taken up and are impactful or innovative, like they spread. And so this is the second part. So the second part of our modeling is to look at these. And uh, we take the approach of uh, quite a few scholars in, in the philosophy and history of science. Uh, in particular, uh, this is just Thomas Kuhn as a quote, uh, to view science and its ideas as a, a constellation arrangement. This goes from Quine through Fiegel all the way up through, uh, you know, Kuhn, Lakatos, on it goes. All these scholars represent science consistently as a set of uh, hypotheses, concepts, ideas in an arrangement of constellation of facts, right? And so this is, we want to try to get at that. And it turns out because theses entail text, we can uh, to some extent. And we look for, in particular, the goal is to find out when uh, significant concepts are meaning, meaning ones that people use uh, consistently that they get used in new ways. And this, this is the representation, the recombination idea of new ideas, novelty. Now, as it gets picked up, that becomes impact. Now, the way we, we identify these terms, because obviously if you, you look at a corpus, it can be en enormous. Um, and what we wanna do is we, we like to identify which terms are significant or meaningful, and then which relationships should we represent. And so there's two kinds of methodological tasks here. And the first is we uh, take this corpus, we do a lot of pre-processing, removing punctuation, numbers, uh, et cetera, uh, lemmatizing, uh, then we find phrases, and then we kind of go through this effort to uh, determine uh, which of these phrases uh, are actually being used in kinds of discourses. And to do this, we use a structural topic model. So basically a, a method that identifies latent dimensions of sorts in language uh, that we then represent. Um, and so terms and documents have loadings on these, uh, basically these topics or discourses or themes, if you will. And um, we want to identify those words, which are the most uh, representative um, uh, in order to kind of give some conceptualization of this network or constellation. So in particular, we, we try to, obviously the number of topics and the number of discourses or themes out there is, is a, a point of contention. How many are there, right? And, and I think ultimately that's kind of a red herring to define what it really is. Um, it, you know, so what we end up doing is we look for the most likely and the most fitting set of topics using a variety of internal and external validation techniques that you can find in the, the paper and I'm happy to talk about as well if there are questions about it. And then we kind of identify around 500 as the, uh, the suitable set for this database. Uh, that predicts those uh, documents. And uh, then we, we, we also do robustness checks on, on a, a range within there from 400 to 600 to see if our results hold, and they do. Uh, but the next step is once you've identified these latent dimensions, which terms within those dimensions are the most salient? And there's different ways to do that too. And so one is you look for the most probable terms and those are, are these like data or study in this case. Um, and then another is that it would be that you look for the most exclusive terms. There 
only used in this topic, not in anything else. And obviously, there's a balance here between you don't want to miss the interdisciplinary language, the probable terms, the general, generic talk, uh, but you also don't want to miss the exclusive ones. So we try to balance this. And again, we do a variety of robustness checks to see if our models hold, depending on how we decide the uh, final set of terms. And so here's an uh, example of astrophysics the kind of terms that we would fly, find in that, uh, one of the topics in astrophysics. Uh, and we eventually choose one of these uh, um, uh, degrees of frequency and uh, exclusivity. Uh, we, we decide that to get 100 terms per topics and come up with our corpus of, of terms that we look at the network of over time and identify where new links come in or, or disappear. Um, so this is the, the general approach. And then we do a bunch of robustness checks with different K, different topics, numbers of topics, and different kinds of thresholds on frequency and exclusivity. In all cases, the, the qualitative results hold. It's the same argument. Okay, so this is, this is the challenge of, of social science research or any kind of research on, on meaning that, that it, it's, it is kind of a fuzzy object in some sense. So we, we try to do robustness checks. Uh, in terms of representing the innovation, this is kind of what it looks like in the end. Uh, does this thesis introduce a new link? Well, in this case, HIV linked to monkey uh, was an innovation in the thesis in the 80s. And then we ask, well, okay, that was done as an innovation or a new uh, a novelty. Now, is it impactful? Does it, does it get taken up? Does it get recognized and used? And this is a key thing because there's a lot of arguments in science where we, we make a lot of discoveries of no value. Uh, the question is whether that value is somewhat socially driven. Um, and uh, in this case, with argument is going to be it's partially so. So looking forward, uh, we ask how much is that novel link used? And that becomes impactful novelty. So here's just to give you an example. Uh, here is an example uh, done by uh, Elizabeth Bruch, uh, who uh, wrote, uh, she was part of uh, Gallo's lab, and in and, and this case was one of the pioneering individuals who linked uh, HIV to monkeys, right? Um, and so she was one of the first in the dissertation space to use this, and then it gets taken up in future dissertations uh, to, to a great extent. Uh, another one in sociology, for those of you who are interested in sociology out there, uh, this is uh, Peter Behrman at Columbia, and he was one of the first uh, individuals to talk about uh, network macro structural forms using block modeling and the shape. And this has gone on to become kind of a, a big deal within social networks research over time. Another one is Donna Strickland, uh, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for her work in which she introduced kind of grading based stretchers uh, used for uh, some sort of laser based measuring device. And you have to excuse me for not being an expert in that area, but hopefully that, that gives you some sense and some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, and then on it goes, there's others that we present in the paper. Uh, for those of you out there who are in computer science, the, uh, you know, Michael Jordan, not, not Michael Jordan, but Michael I. Jordan, uh, was the founder of the machine learning field or one of them. And, and he was a theoretical computer scientist. Uh, who uh, related learning to attractors, and this kind of took off, and there's, there's others in here. Our Landa Sch uh, Scheibinger uh, in history in our department here uh, did some early work that was really uh, instrumental to feminist research on, on uh, revealing uh, masculinity and the justification in science uh, that, that that was used to kind of establish legitimacy for ideas and, and, and uh, subordinate kinds of uh, uh, topics that women, concerning women and the like. So her work is quite uh, important in that sense. So on it, on it goes, we find a bunch of these. So the last part, so now that you have a sense of diversity, like under, how we identify groups uh, that are diverse or underrepresented uh, and what we mean by that. And then the second is notions of novelty, whether they're new linkages of concepts within a thesis, how many, how, the degree to which a thesis is novel as well as the degree to which this thesis, uh, the novel links have impact. So we look at the payoff per link as a, the total number of times these new links are taken up divided by the total number of new links that this thesis generated. These become our metrics of, of novelty and impactful novelty. The last part is uh, careers. How do we see whether these aspects of innovation and uh, heterogeneity have some effect on career outcomes. 
So here I'm going to talk about what we do there. So in this case, the, the career outcome, the nice thing about ProQuest, again, is what's really neat about it is that you can uh, see which of the students, when they graduate uh, with a doctorate, go on to become a primary advisor of another student. And this, this can take upwards of 10 years often, and it, it often reflects whether someone's tenured even in many cases. So it's a very conservative estimate of whether someone uh, breaks into kind of higher ranks and an influence within the academy. Um, continued research careers. Now, we, we fully recognize that there's a lot of different routes that someone can continue doing research, whether you go to a think tank, whether you go to, to uh, one of the labs and companies out there, uh, or whether you go to a liberal arts college and uh, produce undergraduates, uh, you can still uh, continue research. And this may even be preferred uh, to some individuals that want work-life balance and the like, uh, at least within the literature, that's been a, a common argument. So that we wanted to look at this broader uh, notion uh, of careers that might uh, capture more of these uh, underrepresented individuals. So what we do is we look for whether individuals keep publishing five years after their doctorate within the web of science. So it turns out for the first and research faculty, about almost seven, six or seven percent of individuals actually become of the PhDs go on to become uh, research faculty uh, in the future. And in the case of continued research careers, it's more like 30 percent. So it's a little broader notion. And the reason we use both is to show you that the results are pretty consistent uh, across them. So again, another robustness uh, check for outcomes. So this is the, the general idea. Um, and then what we're going to do in the modeling is we, we predict each of, of these. We predict novelty and impactful novelty as a result of diversity, uh, our indicators. We, and then we look at whether uh, the, the novelties and impactful novelties of diverse individuals produce those career outcomes at different rates. So to do this, we, we do a variety of, of statistical models. Um, depending on the distribution of the dependent variables, we will use uh, different uh, uh, means from a negative binomial to a logit uh, to a linear model in some cases. And so what we find here, uh, what we do is controls uh, to make sure that we have kind of an argument that isn't confounded by other factors. Uh, we do university fixed effects. So that removes things like, uh, you know, the, the Stanford effect of us being very fortunate with the kind of uh, supports and resources we have compared to someone at, at another institution. Uh, we use year, uh, which might uh, control for period of, like, or, or not period, uh, cohort effects of different kinds of, of the time that people have to get a career. Uh, and we use disciplines, uh, the 84 disciplines we fix out because uh, to some degree you might expect uh, those to have different practices and cultures of production um, as well as kind of uh, career chances. And we wanted to see net of that, whether uh, these origins and backgrounds of individuals have some effect on their reception or their creation. Uh, we also use weights to make sure the data is kind of uh, representative of the population of US PhDs. So, so we use the census compared to the ProQuest. So here's some results. So the first set of results I wanna show you is whether uh, the underrepresented or the minor numerical minorities uh, have some uh, relationship to novelty. And so if you look at these two plots, um, if you look on the left, uh, the y-axis captures the number of new links per thesis. This is across a, a million theses. Uh, and then on the x-axis, you see the percentage of same gender. So as you go left, it means you're more of a numerical minority. And so what these plots show you is that as you become more of a gender numerical minority, you are introducing uh, novel relationships between concepts at a, at a, a significantly higher rate um, than say, uh, if you're a, a numerical majority. Uh, and so th this is very strong effect in gender. It's slightly as strong for white non-white uh, uh, proportions, but significant nonetheless. So we see that um, uh, certain groups uh, have, have effects. Uh, the less representative they are, the more they bring in fresh relationships. Now, uh, we also look at uh, the, the historical minority kind of uh, characterization to see whether that has some kind of effect as well. And here again, uh, you know, we have, uh, it's a negative binomial, so it's an incidence rate 
uh, which is complicated to describe to everybody, but the idea is that it, for every 10 novel lengths, so a thesis has about 10 on average that it might give, uh, historical minorities may generate almost one more or 0.9 more, uh, so about 10% higher than for white. Um, and then for women, about maybe 6% higher. And this isn't huge, but it's significant and strong across all fields, net of all those controls of time and uh, university and, and a lot of uh, factors put in there that, that remove a lot of variance. So what's going on here is you see that women are more likely than men to introduce novelty in most fields uh, and that non-white individuals are, are more likely as well. So already you're seeing uh, diversity breeds novelty. Now the question is whether diversity breeds impactful novelty. It's one thing to, to uh, create new ideas or new uh, uh, relationships, um, but it's another to have those relationships get taken up, uh, to be utilized. Um, and so uh, this is the next set of results. So here um, you have uh, an effort to identify the impactful novelty as the number of new uh, impact, uh, taken up lengths of, of novel lengths that you've done divided by the total number of the uh, novel links you've had. And it's a question of how uh, uh, different groups of minority status uh, drive that or not, or correspond with that or not. So in particular here, what you see is on the y-axis is the degree of uh, uptake. Uh, and on the x-axis, uh, you see uh, the percent same gender and percent same rate, so numerical minority. And notice it's the opposite of the prior set of findings in the sense that the more your majority, the more your novelties get used, okay? So that's the, the point here. And again, for historical minority, when we do the binary uh, version, we find uh, the same effects as well, that there's some kind of discounting. So, uh, less numerically represented individuals have more novel links. They, they are introducing uh, new things, new ideas, new relationships. Um, historical minorities uh, also, uh, you know, regardless of how we look at it, uh, you know, if, I, uh, if you're a historical minority is women and non-white and a numerically uh, underrepresented could be even uh, men in education per se. Uh, may introduce more novel links. Okay, so this is the idea that we, we make it vary. In both cases, this has some effect. Um, uh, impactful novelty, meaning it's uptake, we find the flip. Uh, so this means that the less numerical represented a gender, uh, and particularly gender, we find it to be significant here, has less uptake. And then for historical minorities, we find significantly less uptake. So there is this kind of uh, diversity breeds innovation, but the innovation is already being discounted to some extent in uptake. Now, the question is, what's, what's going on? Why? And one of the things that we explored uh, was whether the combinations of ideas were distal or proximal uh, by different individuals. So what we did was we took the network of, uh, of concepts. In this case, you see two examples, the fracture behavior and ceramic composition are really proximal to each other and the combination of them really is kind of uh, not as uh, distal, it's proximal. So one could think of it as normal science, tinkering, puzzling. Uh, in the other case of genetic algorithm and HIV infection, here you have kind of a, a bridge, you have kind of a linkage across disparate uh, clusters of, of, of lexicons and discourses and dialogues. And because of that, uh, you could think of it as more distal the um, way we do this is we basically uh, take all these relationships, identify an in-dimensional space of, of, of latent dimensions and language uh, relationships, 100 of them, and then we identify by cosine how similar uh, uh, concepts being combined in a, uh, a document are. And through that, we come up with some kind of distance metric. Okay. Uh, so here's the example where we actually test whether the distance of these uh, combined ideas have some relationship with uh, uh, uptake um, and novelty. And it turns out uh, in the case of, of uh, less, the, the more you have the same gender here on the top uh, left side C, uh, the less distal 
So the, the more that you are a major, the same gender is within your field, the less distal the novelties you are creating. We don't find the same thing for race, uh, but we do for gender. And that seems to kind of mediate uh, the effect for, for gender in particular. But it turns out that any distal novelty has some uh, negative relationship with uh, impactful novelty. So what it means is that the the uptake of, of new combinations is less, the more distant these connections are. This is kind of an echo for those of you familiar with interdisciplinarity uh, as to why we can often understand proximal forms of combination in interdisciplinary fields that are nearby, as opposed to fields that are really far apart. So uh, you can imagine uh, biology and Spanish may be really distal. We don't see a lot of, of that kind of combination, even though it would be maybe perhaps quite fruitful in surprising ways. Uh, we see much more of, of biochem and biophysics perhaps, right? So things closer together. And so this is kind of capturing some of this field, but it's showing it's kind of happening for uh, gen gender and, and potentially racial composition. So the last part is whether uh, the career output, right? Who, who gets a job and who, who goes on in their career and whether these factors of, of novelty and impactful novelty have an effect. I'm only gonna show you, the paper goes through novelty, which is really, it shows you it's a, a much bigger effect that novelty and, and the returns to it, but it's not as conservative a result as impactful novelty. Uh, which is arguing that the degree to which your ideas are taken up and equally between you, uh, two, two groups of white or non-white, whether that has the same returns. So the same impactful novelties, do they give you the same returns uh, in terms of getting a job? And so this is what these uh, graphs will show through a, a logistic regression. So on the left-hand side, you see the probability of becoming research faculty uh, in both cases. On the left, it's gender. On the right, it's race. Um, and so what we try to do is show you the 99% the of the observations in the range and show you the plots of the degree of difference. And, and while this may not look a dramatic, the, the percent differences between these groups are, are reasonably high of uh, three to 15% in some, or four to 15% in some of these cases for gender. Um, so what you find is that uh, the majority gender for their, impactful contributions, those get them more bang for the buck than for uh, uh, the uh, gender minority in this case. In this instance, you see that the racial majority gets far more bang for the buck for the same uh, idea linkages that are taken up at the same rate as uh, the racial minority. So this is a serious disparity in which how uh, contributions are being interpreted uh, and translated into uh, uh, academic jobs. Now, we also do this with regard to continued research. And this is the more generic or broader view. And it's similar result in the sense that on the left, you see that uh, different genders, uh, I mean, uh, minority gender is, is at a, a deficit or discounted in terms of their contributions, whereas the majority is perhaps amplified for their contributions um, on the left. And then on the right, you see that the minority uh, group on race is, uh, in terms of a continued research career, doesn't really ever catch up for most of the distribution of the observations. So even if it is a slightly uh, a higher slope, it, uh, for the range of most observations, it's not as if uh, that is a, a catch up. Um, so, so what we have here is uh, the question was, does the diversity innovation paradox hold for science? And the argument is yes, uh, at least uh, descriptively and, and you know, correlationally, we're finding this clearly present um, and through a, a, a many different uh, robustness checks. So please see the paper for uh, those efforts. We tried it many different ways here. Uh, but so basically the, the finding is diversity does breed novelty. Um, uh, at the time that which you create new links, that some of these links are recognized more than others, usually for majority group over the minority groups. Um, and then in addition, even if you have the same kinds of contributions in terms of impactful novelty, meaning new linkages that get taken up at the same rate, those don't have the same value in terms of translation to careers. Uh, again, we see a discounting. 
Um, so part of this is to argue that what, what's going on is that we have uh, some degree of, of understanding here and generalization of, of how underrepresented groups uh, may have their ideas devalued and this may affect scientific careers and the diversification of the scientific workforce. Um, so again, uh, we find these things. I think the, the basic implications here, if, if, uh, if you don't mind me extrapolating a little bit, is that um, uh, underrepresented groups, because they're historically underrepresented, may come in with very different perspectives and concerns. Uh, a lot of research showed that the inclusion of, of women in health uh, brought in all sorts of uh, revolutions in terms of women's health topics that were unaddressed, that samples of, of heart studies were all men prior to the 1980s, and that the inclusion of women diversified those kinds of, uh, of research agendas, or even made issues concerning women in particular uh, much more relevant and, and a topic. Um, so a lot of these, uh, the other, so in that sense, they're things that just aren't there unless you bring in individuals uh, from diverse origins. But beyond that, it may be that they have uh, different perspectives. People from different walkways and different origins may have very different uh, perspectives and link things in novel ways. And so this is something that quite a few theorists have, have talked about, and we kind of find some evidence of this. Um, it seems like the implication too is that diversification and representation seem to be pretty uh, crucial aspects that as the majority and minority uh, turn in terms of which uh, direction of, uh, of representation that that kind of affects the reception of these uh, linkages and ideas so that having greater parity and, and uh, diversity should be of help to getting ideas noticed. Um, there is this kind of uh, interesting part too about the implications due to the distal nature of the ideas and whether that mediates or explains some of the, the bias that we see, uh, it, it raises the question of how do we, how do we bring, how do we create translation within uh, uh, science and scholarship so that the ideas that may be on the belt, like Lakatosh would say, uh, are brought into relationship with the core uh, set of ideas more or that they're recognized. So it may be that a lot of uh, new groups or uh, underrepresented groups have, have distinct interests and distinct kinds of discourses potentially. And the question becomes, how does, how does uh, a prior established work come into a greater conversation with that that's uh, translated and interpretable for both parties uh, or groups? So in a lot of ways, to me, the, the more I get into this, it's a little bit like interdisciplinarity and the prior research that my lab has done and, and a lot of studies we've done is on interdisciplinarity. And um, in some sense, the more distal the, the fields, the harder it is to kind of create linkages and, and transfer. Uh, the trading zone is too far apart. There isn't really one. And so creating these trading zones or boundary objects or things that people kind of converge around and uh, translate across or constantly kind of come into a, a, a more dense uh, conversation that they bridge, that they fill in these holes uh, intellectual holes in our, our knowledge is, is kind of a, a great thing uh, to consider. So the last thing is our, our current efforts that we're continuing. We're doing other tests. Uh, we've, we have looked at uh, whether the results hold in the web of science. We find uh, support for uh, the same uh, kind of argument. It's not just in uh, dissertations. Albeit there, there are drawbacks to the web of science in terms of uh, it's more biomed, it's uh, it may not represent fast and slow science, fast meaning conference proceedings, slow in terms of books. So it has a representational issue that dissertations kind of uh, do a better job with, uh, in my opinion. Uh, we also are looking into field variation. It turns out every time I present this, everybody's like, well, what about my field? What about, what about neuroscience? What about, you know, uh, is this a problem for fem uh, feminism and gender, right? Uh, et cetera. And, and these are things that uh, we put in as a fixed effect and control out because we're trying to make a generalizable argument. But obviously, uh, there is variation. And this is something worth exploring and looking at because the problems or the concerns may be different by, by field. Uh, other thing is we're looking at is in the case of race, we didn't find a, uh, a strong effect about the distal uh, uh, linkages. So what we're looking into there is whether it's a social network one in the sense that 
uh, the ideas may be taking, be, they may be getting taken up, the novel linkages, but what may be happening uh, is that uh, because of peripheral positioning in social networks of collaboration and, and institutions uh, and lack of representation that this prevents their recognition. And this raises an important question about appropriation, which is whether uh, um, there is something going on here uh, across fields where certain ideas and linkages are being appropriated by uh, certain fields or, or various groups are absorbed into the, the core of scientific endeavors without recognition. So we're also exploring citation because citation conventions vary. Um, and this might be of, of great interest uh, to people in kind of uh, giving credit due. Now we have lots of other studies going on and um, we have things, uh, well, postdoc of mine, Lano Kim is, is really focused on whether gender, the, the gender reference in your text are, are uh, uh, useful for uh, you in terms of getting a career, like uh, correcting uh, uh, missing information about genders as a topic. So women in, in medicine, for example, by making that more of a, a particular topic within medicine, does that make for careers? And it turns out it does. But she also looks at whether uh, gender association, whether uh, by association of particular gender with a field, does that get discounted as implicit bias? So women uh, historically have tended to look at early childhood development, men historically have tended to look at, you know, particle physics, right? And so whether those associations net of the gender involved have some kind of discounting on people. And she's finding there's an implicit bias there that persists um, and it can kind of change uh, as to where it locates, but that's occurring. Uh, other work that we're doing, translational research and innovation, which is about whether ideas travel across fields. Uh, bias in, in journal reviewing, uh, we're also uh, beginning to explore. So we have a variety of things, but I, I think if you took a step back, the general idea here isn't uh, to question uh, uh, science as a endeavor, but to recognize that this is a, uh, as a community. And uh, as a community uh, with its heterogeneity and its variation, we, we can have certain problems that communities have. Uh, but we also have a strength as communities where we, we check each other, we come to standards, we come to, to uh, uh, find consensus and, th and things. So the, the notion of a social structure of science uh, has both good and bad things that mm -hmm. through kind of epistemological vigilance on these things that, that hopefully we can kind of better achieve uh, our ideals. So that's the, the general sentiment and idea behind this. So thank you for your, your attention and time. Great, thanks, Dan. That was a that was a just a lovely talk. And we're ready now to go to the audience questions on Slido. Um, and we have some really great questions. It's kind of a dream audience, I think, because they seem to know a lot about innovation and underrepresentation. So this is really super. Should I so turn off the slide share, or is that fine? Yeah, I think I think uh, you could turn off the slide share. Um, uh, unless some questions, you know, might cause you to bring the slides back. Um, so one question comes from Tom, um, who asks, um, uh, do, you know, uh, in the presence of all these problems like discounting of minorities and, and newcomers to the field, um, do impactful innovations win out in the end? So he suggests, Barabasi has suggested that, that it's, that in the end, you know, uh, 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 um, innovation, good innovations win out. Is this true? Do you find this? What, what are your thoughts? So we, we actually, this is correct. I, slides can only relate so much. <laughs> uh, we're actually exploring this right now. And I think the, the preliminary results, we, we try to look at whether distal ideas and linkages uh, have a slower burn, meaning that they have a slower slope, but they get taken up more later. Um, the initial results suggest yes. And we actually find this too with, with interdisciplinarity, that the, the more distal interdisciplinarity finds poor reception at first, uh, and that over time, it has greater reception than proximal ideas. So uh, the same thing can be said, it's high risk, high reward. So it, it, it may be that these distal things, uh, some of it's lost, right? Uh, and then those that aren't are really gangbusters. 
So uh, I, I think that's the kind of thing that we're finding evidence for, but it, it clearly needs quite a bit of uh, shoring up and testing 20 different ways. But I, I think the current argument is, is that the, the, the more distal relationships uh, come to have greater relevance in the long term uh, than the proximal links. So that would right. be one indication. It's hard to say whether that's, um, you know, you have to look at each idea ultimately to say whether it's that's a good idea. And this is very hard. And I, I suspect Tom or whomever knows this. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, uh, uh, a really related follow-up question from Rania, which is uh, thinking about uptake. What's the effect? Is there, do you have any way to measure the effect of the minority scholars network? Like let's say mentors who could be minorities or not. Is there any way to, to look at the social um, elements of this question? Yes, uh, so we, we have a follow-up paper uh, that we're finishing and uh, it, it actually goes much more into mentoring. So one of the questions, what do you do? What, what can you do? And um, so we look at whether uh, we, in the advising data of ProQuest, you can identify the thesis advisor and you can identify the traits of that advisor. And one of the things we, we are finding consistently is that uh, underrepresented groups um, uh, have more successful careers and feel more supported as the proportion of, of their uh, uh, group is present, uh, but also having a same gender or same attribute advisor uh, can be quite supportive. And the argument is that it's not a, an essentialist argument that, oh, we have to then pair everybody, but that there's something occurring in those relationships where individuals may experience aggressions or feel excluded, a chilly climate or a, a leaky pipeline, where those advisors have gotten through and, and may be able to afford some information. And it might be something that people like me can learn from. Uh, and so I think that learning from that is kind of a, the thing that we're, we're trying to figure out right now and how to prescribe that. But the, there is an effect of these advisors and uh, uh, clearly the social networks seem to be relevant. And, and we think that that may be some part of the explanation as to why, even if you have innovative ideas that get taken up, that it's discounted because you're not positioned central to this community. And so therefore uh, the outlets and the places you hit may not recognize it as much. Well, that's really interesting. A, a couple of questions um, really uh, try to tease apart this, this thing you just said. So you have these discounting, these barriers that underrepresented scholars have to overcome. Uh, does that really mean that your results underestimate the problem because you could imagine that there's some kind of social friction or personal cost of people breaking these social barriers that might penalize your energy or you know if you have a, if the impactful novelty is undercounted so you your career does less well well you're going to be less likely to be publishing more and that's going to that's going to um, you know be a vicious cycle yeah i, I mean if there's one one takeaway for this article is that we've probably underestimated. So this is conservative in terms of, I, I think, in terms of the discounting going on. And that, that's not only for the reasons you mentioned, which are there are a lot of implicit and indirect paths of, of uh, confronting barriers uh, that we don't measure. But beyond that, we've probably underrepresented uh, the minorities to begin with in terms of, of uh, our, our methods for names. Uh, so we are conservative in terms of that as well. So uh, both cases, uh, we expect if we had perfect data, uh, the effect sizes would be higher, not lower, uh, because the biases of our metrics and our uh, coefficients of everything are kind of underrepresenting um, as opposed to over. Yeah, nice. And what about, uh, uh, Albert asks, what about um, other kinds of diversity? What about socioeconomic diversity, um, geographic diversity? Is there any way that you could get a handle on that? So we, we do look at, in the web of science, we look at whether you're international in terms of where you're located. Uh, and we actually do have, in other work, uh, we actually classify the uh, un the names that we can't attribute to the census or these voter rolls or the, the American data. 
uh, as international. We actually have data on uh, thousands of international or many thousands of international names. And we have some degree of liability of, of uh, identifying individuals that are likely to be international uh, more than usual uh, than other names, right? And so we've looked at that and we do find a similar story again, which is uh, international, um, maybe underrepresented and, and not be as recognized. And so, but to some extent, this is confounded with other things, which is uh, international students often want to go back or, or uh, to their countries as well. So we train a lot of people for other countries and they wouldn't be represented in our data. So it's not really clear there, but in terms of web of science and uptake of, of links and ideas, we, we find some indication that this for across international and domestic that the domestic has an advantage. Nice. And what about, um, what about- uh, That's not uh, SES, I, uh, that's yeah, harder. Yeah, SES seems hard, right? So, like, uh, yeah. Getting its socioeconomic status seems difficult. Yeah, um, you you don't have a lot of demographics of the of the of the scientists. But you could yeah. do a survey, and, and arguably there's reason to do it. And the 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 uh, survey of earned doctorates is some information on this to some degree. Yeah. Nice. Another demographic question from Jeffrey. Um, do you have any data on, for example, search committee demographics? You could imagine that where the search committee trained or their demographic information could be a variable. I know you're thinking about journal reviewers and their, their kinds of, of um, demographic properties, but uh, either one, are there things you can say about, about uh, gatekeeping there? Yeah, so I, uh, we, through, through incredibly Fort Knox means, have access to some journal reviewing data and it's highly uh, protected and, and hard to get for obvious reasons that people's careers or could be harmed or uh, what have you. Uh, in the case of search committees, um, you know, tenure and, and reviews and hiring, uh, uh, you know, if you go 50 years back in universities, the records, you can find some at a lot of places, but today it's, it's pretty much constrained by lawyers and concerns of those. So you have a really hard time getting access to that. And universities I have found are not uh, eager to share that information uh, at scale that we would like to have uh, to do those kinds of assessments. It would take a university that uh, is brave and uh, willing to share its faults and learn from them openly uh, to do that. And maybe the public universities, uh, you might be able to find that more readily than, than I have. Uh, but uh, I think it's absolutely right to make this a little more open, uh, at least protected and analyzable would be of great value to all of us. Uh, as long as we protect the individuals involved, I, I think that should be done personally. Yeah, that's really nice. And your mention of public universities uh, you know, brings up another question from Tom, who says, you know, you, you did a nice job controlling for things. You controlled for the university, you controlled for time. Um, what are the effects of those, those variables? Like, are, are, do you see different um, effects in public versus private universities? Or, or is there a effective time? Are, 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 diverse scholars introducing more no novel ideas over time or less novel ideas over time, or are they finally getting more recognized than they used to be? Or, you know, are things getting better or worse? Yeah, so that's what we're, we're trying to look at. I think the problem with any data set like this is that uh, over time you have, there's right censoring, right? So people haven't had time to get a job like the people from the eighties have. Uh, or to get published. And so there is some degree of, of diminished, like your coefficients aren't as uh, wonderful uh, there. And so that's kind of a, a challenge in terms of plotting and comparisons over time. Uh, I know with a million people, you think, well, that should be doable, but some of these groups get pretty small quick uh, in terms of underrepresented minorities in particular. Um, so it, it, it is a challenge, but we're trying to look at that right now. In terms of private public, Yes, private has an advantage uh, consistently. Um, the more uh, higher rank universities have an advantage consistently. Um, so uh, those, those are evident, but the time thing is uh, it gets, you have less of a, 
a bracket to capture things. So it's harder to kind of estimate things as you get closer to 2010. Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking at that right now. And uh, at least with gender, we find things are kind of consistent uh, is my understanding thus far. Uh, and we're trying to explore other, uh, exactly what you're asking. But nice. as you see in the paper, we're trying to be very careful. Yeah, it's right. No, it's a first paper. It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, Chandra asks, what about, um, is there any way you could estimate um, more about impact than just uptake? Like, could you estimate the economic or impact of some kind of, of the novelties? Is there some way to get at something deeper than just whether it's influencing other scholarship, but is it, is it, is it turning into something in the real world? I don't know, patents, or I don't know how you'd measure this. Yes, uh, so the project with Hunching Cow uh, is exactly about that, that we're, we're looking at whether um, these ideational contributions and um, whether in terms of a new concept or a new concept linkage, uh, whether those are transferring and, and having influence on patents and clinical trials. Uh, so this is a little specific. It's not quite as far as we'd like um, to uh, profit or uh, to um, saving lives or, or practice at the bedside. We haven't gotten that far uh, and there's reasons to stop short for now. Uh, but, but we are trying to explore it in terms of whether, uh, and these are different worlds, the, the patent world and the clinical trial world, very little of, of basic research gets there. It's, it's tremendously small and the citation is tremendously inaccurate and biased. And, and <laughs> you know, there's a lot of appropriation of basic research. You, you, you can insert your favorite anecdote about someone in basic research that invented something or did something that didn't get any of the billion dollars that that resulted in in a patent. And we're, we're trying to look at uh, those kind of things, not to make research about profit, but, but to show that we're contributing uh, basic research. And even, I would love to be able to show even that humanities and, and social sciences that we, we have an indirect, but relevance to what happens elsewhere as well. And uh, so we, we are trying to look at that. It's, it's a little challenging, but I, I think the idea is that these individual ideas and contributions to some extent uh, reflect a more fine-grained uh, way of, of identifying contributions and identifying what uptake and influence there is into these kind. Like for every patent, there's a, there's a million things in it, right? Or not million, but quite a few. And some of those may be a research idea that are central to that technology or to that clinical trial in terms of understanding why they did that. And so that's what we're trying to target and figure out those linchpins in research that transfer. Fabulous. Well, this was, um, these were great audience questions and it was a really informative and interesting talk. I wanna thank all of you out in the audience for joining us today. We appreciate your participation in the seminar. See you. Um, See you next week for the next uh, I seminar. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everybody in the audience. Take care, everyone.